Good morning. Good morning to all of, all of you who are out there, wherever you are, whoever you are. I am Harry Chuck, and I am at Covenant Presbyterian Church in San Francisco. I'm sitting in the pastor's office today, and uh, it is my privilege to share with you some thoughts that I have on the passage from Matthew, 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 1. But first, I have a question for you. Do you like Chinese food? If you like Chinese food, then you'll love Chinese banquets. And by far the most elaborate banquets are wedding parties. The bridal party is beautifully dressed. The men look very dapper in their rented tuxedos. And the parents of the bride and groom are having a gay time greeting their guests. You can expect excellent cuisine. The food is always good. And you can have as many as 10 to 12 dishes. And also you can have as many as a thousand people as your guests. But my favorite dish at the banquets is the sparkling apple cider. It's only served, I think, at uh, Chinese banquets and parties. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without a line dance, weaving between the seated guests and uh, accompanied by clanging cymbals and pounding drums. From Matthew 22, we read that Jesus tells us about a king who's planned a lavish wedding for his son. Invitations are delivered to the king's circle of very close friends, and it promises to be a very auspicious occasion. You might say that it's one of those once in a lifetime events, and it's a party that no one will want to miss. So the king is really surprised when one after another, the guests send their regrets. They cite things that they have to do, places where they have to be. But if you listen carefully, some of these reasons given sound rather contrived. So the king is a bit puzzled. These are people he has known for years. He has sent invitations to all the right people. These are the elite in his kingdom. They are the ones that he has personally chosen as friends. And most of them have thrived with his help. But in this moment of truth, he discovers that they don't value him as seriously as he does them. So the king assumes that, well, there must be a mistake. Let's try this again. So he sends out another invitation. But there is no mistake. Word gets back to the king that his second invitation has not only been ignored and rejected, but his messengers, his servants, have been terribly abused. Uh, they've been met with violence, and some of them have received such rough treatment that they don't even return. Whatever relationship the king had with these friends is now permanently severed. It is a very sad moment. So enough is enough, and the king sends his troops to punish these ungrateful guests. Let's have another look at verses 8 to 10. This comes from a, a modern paraphrase called the Bible in contemporary language, the message. Then he told his servants, we have a wedding banquet all prepared, but no guests. The ones I invited, they weren't up to it. So go out into the busiest intersections in town and invite anyone 
anyone that you find to this banquet. The servants went out to the streets and they rounded up everyone that they could lay their eyes on, good and bad, regardless. And so the banquet was on. Every place, every seat was filled. We are living in turbulent times, in a nation and a world which is deeply divided. We see ourselves sometimes taking sides. It's hard not to. Mention something along racial, sexist, and political lines, and you have blood pressures rising. And concepts like truth and trust and loyalty seem to fall upon deaf ears. It's too much news and really not enough information. And this has led to confusion, uncertainty, fear, and distrust. Those of us who are part of a community of faith, we are also living at a time when we have more questions than answers. For example, what is the message here for me as a Christian? And what is Christ saying in this parable about my relationship with God? And what is this story saying to us about our relationship to others? This parable about an invitation speaks to us about our relationship to God. It is a reminder that it is God who initiates this invitation. Sometimes we'll hear people say, well, I found God, or I found Jesus. Well, not to slight their testimony, but by saying this, we seem to have things turned around because it is God who reaches out to us with an invitation to be in relationship to Christ. When I was a 10th grader, someone gave me a book. It was just a thin paperback, and I'll never forget its title. It was God's Search for Man. This book was very helpful to me because it clarified that it was I who was lost and ultimately found. It is we who are the object of God's love. And it is we who are restored to God through Jesus Christ. Neither God nor Jesus are lost, but rather it is us. We who are found and saved and restored through God's love. Going back again to the 10th verse. The servants gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Put in the back of your mind that couplet, the bad and the good. You may have heard me say this before, but I think it's worth recalling. In the church, God chooses our friends for us, both bad and the good. We do not have vetting options to decide who's in and who's out. And God, like the king in our story, it is God who determines who's on the guest list and where we'll all be seated at the Lord's table. 